Section 1 of Margaret of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Margaret of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. Section 1 preface the sixteenth century that age of great women shows few more truly eminent than the sister of francis i margaret of angouleme of valois and of france queen of navarre duchess of alencon and berry was a person of importance in many different ways in political influence she was perhaps excelled by margaret of austria catherine de medici and elizabeth of england and elizabeth if not more devoted was at least more successful as a reformer of religion but the queen of navarre possessed many qualities foreign to these famous names of all the women of her age vittoria colonna alone was her rival in literary attainments and in the rarer and more illustrious authority of personal grace and charm she was unequalled save by mary queen of scots or the magical diana of poitiers the student of character may find another interest in the sweet dense simple spirit of margaret a comparatively trifling and unreal nature by the side of the vehement and audacious personages of her time but which none the less directed them influenced them and checked their headlong course in the same manner as the youthful character of raphael maintained an unceasing authority over the wilder spirits of his school it is in her influence that we must seek the prestige of the queen of navarre and not in her faded literary laurels or in a personality rather interesting than great it was she who inspired the college of france it was she who protected and guaranteed the renaissance in france from the ignorant rage of the sorbonne she was in melanchthon's phrase the divinity of the great religious movement of her time and the upholder of the mere natural rights of humanity in an age that only respected opinions it is thus as an organic part of the history of her time as an influence as an inspiring spirit that i have tried to depict her and not as a sequestered individual the task is intricate and large and the space given me to fill is very narrow but so far as it goes this little sketch may perhaps be of some service in indicating the movements of the earlier french renaissance i have tried to make it as far as possible correct i have in most instances sought my facts in the many published volumes of original documents rather than in any subsequent history and where i have given an unusual date it is i hope most often because recent research has disproved the earlier reading recent research ever so commendably critical and untiring in france has happily disproved many last century scandals and one revived not many years ago m lutherot in a review called le Semeur, and m le comte de la ferriere in his introduction to the account book of the queen of navarre have with others satisfactorily proved that a certain compromising letter which tradition gave to the year fifteen twenty one must be dated as fifteen twenty five the year of margaret's hurried flight from spain in which circumstances as will be seen the construction to be placed upon it involves no shade of censure no doubt some confusion with the gay and brilliant reine margot queen of many lovers has been the origin of the unfounded scandals which haunt the memory of the earlier margaret for the younger princess was also margaret of valois and of france also the wife of a henry king of navarre moreover brantome wrote of our heroine on fait de galanterie elle en savoit plus que de son pain quotidien but we must remember that in brantome's eyes the sense of intrigue and of amour was by no means the only sense of galanterie 
which signified indeed as properly it still should do rather gentility courteous and magnanimous behaviour chivalry and pleasing address no phrase could be more suited to margaret the generous egeria of two royal courts the storyteller par excellence of her age whose palace at nerac assumed the double aspect of an asylum for persecuted scholars and a refined and spiritual court of love end of section one section two of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter one childhood and marriage fourteen ninety one to fifteen fifteen when louisa of savoy beautiful accomplished barely fifteen years old was given in marriage to charles of orleans count of angouleme it can have seemed no brilliant alliance on her part the bridegroom was twenty years older than the bride of fallen fortunes and banished from the court of france that he was a possible heir to the crown can only be counted on as a splendid piece of heraldry for the young king charles the eighth was newly wedded to anne of brittany and his sister's husband the heir presumptive was a vigorous young man of nine-and-twenty likely to live long and have many children these two young lives stood between the crown and the count of angouleme it was not likely that he delicate gentle fastidious should outlive them but the count's position as a possible heir made him an honourable match though poor for the girlish princess of savoy her father sanctioned the marriage gladly louise's mother was dead and he had children by his second wife he was willing to marry his elder daughter honourably and without expense on her marriage he gave with her a dowry of thirty five thousand livres a small sum considering that her mother had been a very wealthy heiress but philip of savoy with several children to endow and a throne ever threatened by the surrounding kingdoms had many uses for his money the count of angouleme for his part assigned the castles of cognac and romorantin to louisa and these were to remain to her as dower houses in the event of her widowhood finally all affairs being settled charles of orleans in the year fourteen ninety one was married to his youthful bride the count went with his wife to live on his property in angouleme from the french court he was debarred by the king's displeasure for the reason that long ago he had joined the rebellion of brittany it was no punishment to charles to live a country life his gentle and quiet tastes his benevolence his gift for organization all were employed and satisfied in the orderly routine of managing a great property he had his reward in peaceful years and in the loving devotion of his tenantry but such a life might easily have wearied a beautiful child of fifteen exceedingly accomplished a princess brilliant and fond of power there was however in louise's nature a passionate capacity for devotion this in fact is the keynote of her life she fell in love deeply and all sufficingly with her courteous elderly husband the banishment in which he shone delighted her the delicate chivalry of his character won her passionate approval at this age she must have been a beautiful girl with aquiline features in which the latent coarseness was as yet undeveloped dark with an ardent italian air she knew a little latin and was fond of quoting it she was well and widely read in french and could speak several modern languages there were few better instructed princesses in europe her manners at this time were gentle and submissive for she had voluntarily bowed herself under the yoke of an impassioned reverence the violent ambition of her later years was still unguessed and latent in her soul 
Charles and his bride spent the first year of their marriage in the castle of Angouleme, and there, in the following spring, their eldest child was born. In the journal, in which later on Louisa noted the great events of her life, she thus records the date. My daughter Margaret was born in the year 1492, the eleventh day of April, at two o'clock in the morning, that is to say, the tenth day, fourteen hours and ten minutes, counting after the fashion of the astronomers. As the little girl grew out of babyhood, people noticed that her mother's aquiline features were softened in her face by the look and smile of her gentle father, and that in her character his delicate and benevolent nature qualified the love of learning and capacity for devotion which her mother gave her. More intense than he, more refined and unworldly than Louisa, the little Margaret displayed a singular and beautiful personality. The young countess was very proud of her, and almost from her cradle began to cultivate the sensitive intelligence of the child. But while Margaret was still little more than a baby, a more important personage appeared upon the scene, one who henceforth should be the very center of existence both to Margaret and to her mother. Francis, by the grace of God, King of France, and my Pacific Caesar, took his first experience of earthly light at Cognac about ten hours after noon, the twelfth day of September, 1494. So triumphantly runs Louise's journal, but the next entry sobers all that joy. The first day of January, 1496, I lost my husband. An intermittent fever, common and fatal in those days of imperfect drainage, carried off the Count of Angouleme at forty, and left Louisa a widow in her twentieth year. For some weeks it appeared as though her two little children might be left utterly desolate, for broken down with long nursing and a most bitter sorrow, the young countess fell seriously ill. She was, however, too young, too vigorous to die of grief. She recovered, finding in her children sufficient motive for existence. Retiring to her dower house of Romorantin, Louisa busied herself in training Margaret. This girl she intended to become the most accomplished princess of her age. Madame de Chatillon, a lady of great learning, rank, and virtue, was engaged as governess to the young princess, and scholars of note were employed to instruct her in Latin, in philosophy, and in divinity. But if Louisa cared so well for her daughter, yet more absolutely was she engrossed by the future of her infant son. Her passionate heart, left empty by her husband's death, gave harbor to an unrestrained ambition, and her dreams began early to fulfill themselves. On the 6th of April, 1498, the young king died childless, and his childless brother-in-law, Louis, Duke of Orléans, succeeded him under the title of Louis the Twelfth. These events made the little boy at Romorantin heir presumptive to the throne of France. But Louis was anxious to leave a nearer heir. He divorced his faithful, ugly wife, the crippled daughter of Louis XI, and espoused Anne of Brittany, the beautiful queen dowager, whom he had desired to marry in his early youth. Anne and Louisa were implacable at heart. The stern little Breton queen was as obstinate as the countess, but far more sedate, determined, ambitious, and secret. She had a great contempt for Louisa's violent aspirations. A very rigid Catholic, she looked with misliking on the free speech and wide reading of the young Countess of Angouleme. But King Louis was resolved to be friends with his handsome cousin and her children. It was indeed to Louise's castle of Romorantin that Anne repaired to await her first confinement. With what strenuous prayer and hope, and with what humiliating fear, that event was awaited, only those can understand who have sounded the deep inexorable rivalry between these two women. On the 13th of October, 1499, 
the child was born. It was a daughter, the Princess Claude of France. Elle fut née en ma maison, writes Louisa in her diary. From that moment she determined the little girl should marry her boy Francis, and not some powerful foreign prince who might forcibly break the Salic law. Naturally, Anne was of a contrary opinion. The queen was young, was of Louisa's own age, three and twenty. A son might be born to her to mock all Louisa's hopes and dreams. From this intense expectation, neither one nor the other of these women was ever free. But the years went on, and no male child was given to Anne. Then, one crucial morning, a son was born. But, writes Louisa in her journal with an almost savage triumph, he could not retard the exultation of my Caesar, for he had no life. Sharp anxiety and goading ambition had so changed by this time the gentle wife of Charles of Angoulême. Louisa brought up her son as befitted a king. Her castle of Romorantin was scarcely large enough to hold the court and retinue of the young heir of France, and for this purpose the beautiful palace of Amboise was assigned to her by the king. As years went on, Louis grew to regard the young Count of Angoulême as his heir, and despite the bitter jealousy of Queen Anne, he loved the boy and treated him with care and kindness. He created Francis, Duke of Valois. He consulted the child's taste with fatherly foresight, and when his young cousin came to court, Louis had the royal park filled with deer and game, so that Francis might not be debarred from his favorite pleasure of the chase. Meanwhile, at Amboise, Francis was educated with the greatest nobles of France. Of these boy companions, five in especial were to become conspicuous in the history of his life. Gaston de Foix, the king's nephew, the thunderbolt of Italy, as people learned to call him, who ten years later, in the flower of his youth, should perish in the moment of victory on the desolate Ravenna marshes the light-hearted Bonnivet, Margaret's too daring lover, killed at Pavia, the brilliant and gay Philippe Brion, Sieur de Chabot, so often favored and disgraced by Francis in later years, and a more potent influence, Anne de Montmorency, the determined, stern, narrow-hearted boy, on whom his godmother, the Breton Queen, seemed to have bestowed her pure and relentless nature with her name. Lastly, the unfortunate Charles de Montpensier, the Bourbon cadet, whose passionate, vindictive character and tragic Italian face betrayed the Gonzaga adventurer that doubled this French noble. These boys were taught all things that befit young princes, Latin, courtly languages, hunting, the dance, music was as yet an embryo, a mere thrum of the lute or burr of the organ, jousting, tennis, tilting at the ring, fencing and wrestling. At all their games there was one deeply interested looker-on, one whom all strove to please, the queen of the little court, this was Mademoiselle d'Angoulême. At this time there was some talk of affiancing the little girl to the young Prince of Wales, afterwards Henry of England, eighth of the name. King Louis sent an ambassador to the English court. Henry the Seventh dispatched a special envoy to Paris. But though the English ambassador reported the little princess très belle et fort sage de son âge, nothing came of these negotiations, for Henry declared that though a daughter of Louis would be the alliance nearest to his heart, yet while the king and queen were still so young and vigorous, he could not consider Mademoiselle d'Angoulême as sister to the heir of France. Nevertheless, with every day, Francis became more evidently the heir, and at Plessis, on May 22, 1507, he married the little girl born at his mother's castle, in order to unite her inheritance of Brittany and Orléans with the crown. This was ample recognition, and yet the triumph of Louisa was not all sweetness, for we find her writing in her journal, the 3rd of August, 1508, 
my son went from Amboise to live at court and left me all alone. Within the year, the little Charles of Spain sent an embassy to King Louis, requesting the hand of Mademoiselle d'Angouleme. This would have been a far more brilliant alliance than the English match, and Louisa would gladly have given her consent. But the king refused. Perhaps he thought it dangerous to wed a French princess with the natural rival of France, very probably Anne, who still counted on Charles for some yet unborn daughter of her own, persuaded him not to break her heart and grant this second triumph to her rival. The heir of Spain was dismissed, and Queen Anne selected a very different bridegroom, more suitable in years, but not at all in spirit. This was Charles of Alençon, first prince of the blood, a duke with power of life and death in his duchy, almost a petty sovereign. He was a handsome, dull, inefficient youth of twenty, without ideas or presence, and of a brooding and jealous temper. There was, however, no ground for rejecting the choice of the queen, eager to humiliate her insatiable rival. The Duke of Alençon was an honorable match for Mademoiselle d'Angouleme. Descended from that Charles I of Valois, who was made Count of Alençon by his brother Philip the Fair, Monsieur d'Alençon came of a house which for two centuries had been glorious and quasi-royal. And yet he was stupid and mean of spirit, a sad mate for the gay, brilliant, mystical girl he was to marry, whose tender radiance and smile of wistful rapture deserved a happier destiny. It was also a profound disappointment to Louisa that having refused the King of Spain, her pearl of princesses should be given to a simple duke. Yet this came to pass, Margaret obediently suffering her dismal fate. So for a while mother and children were divided. Francis living in impatient restraint at court, Louisa filling her craving heart with infinite ambitions in her childless castle at Cognac, Margaret unhappy, dispirited, drooping in her husband's palace at Alençon, far from the gaiety, the cultured intercourse, the love and happiness to which she had been accustomed all her life. Margaret was now seventeen years old. She was not beautiful, but very charming. She was tall, graceful of carriage, slim and delicate in air. Her thick blonde hair was hidden away under a black coif, and this fashion gave a certain severity to her long, pale face. The eyes, blue and expressive, smiled sweetly under arching brows. Her nose was the long, large nose of Francis, but more delicate and irregular in her, with a sort of ripple in it. She had a little neatly rounded chin and a very sweet mouth, with a wistful, pathetic smile, well knowing the way, dire nenni avec un doux sourire. Yet despite her pensive countenance, she was, we have her word for it, de moule joyeuse vie, quoique toutefois femme de bien. At Alençon, alas, there was no joyous life. The duke, gloomy, jealous, mediocre, interested merely in the details of his estate, was a respectable youth, but not the man to make a Margaret happy. She pursued her studies as the one means of escape from this irksome existence. Madame de Chatillon, her governess, had accompanied the young duchess as first lady of honor. Under her direction, doubtless, Margaret began to give more and more of her attention to her favorite study of divinity. Her mystical, indefinite mind was attracted toward religious speculation, and Madame de Chatillon was well acquainted with the new ideas then already beginning to stir the soul of France. This lady was in later years suspected of Lutheranism, and it was said that she had secretly married the innovating Cardinal du Bellay. But as yet, Lutheranism did not exist. She and her pupil, however, had gone forth to seek it. Meanwhile, Louisa was perplexed with more earthly anxieties. 
in fifteen ten the nation became aware that a new heir might be expected to the crown of france these were months of exaltation to queen anne while louisa understood how terribly all her ambitions would be overthrown should a royal prince be born in october a little girl came into the world madame rene de france then for a moment the anxiety of louisa was appeased but a worse trial was in store the queen never recovered that disappointment three years afterwards she died and louisa discovered that the death of her enemy had brought a new and terrible evil upon her nine months after the death of anne the king who had mourned her with little less than frenzy married mary the beautiful young sister of the english king louisa's hatred for this new rival and her contempt for the king are manifest even in the meagre lines of her diary the twenty second of september king louis the twelfth very old and feeble fort antique et débile went out of paris to meet his young wife queen mary the ninth of october was held the amorous wedding of louis king of france and mary of england the third day of november fifteen fourteen before eleven o'clock i arrived at paris and the selfsame day without resting i was advised to go and salute queen mary at st denis and i left paris at three o'clock with a great number of gentlemen the fifth of november fifteen fourteen queen mary was crowned at st denis and the sixth day made her entry into paris then the journal no longer chronicles the triumphs of a rival the first day of november fifteen fifteen my son was king of france end of section two Section 3 of Margaret of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. The Young King and His Rivals, 1515-1520. While the young queen sat in her chamber reading her missal, submitting to her mother-in-law, and embroidering red silken counterpanes the duchess of alencon queened it over the court of france the brilliant egeria of a half-dozen poets for claude although the wife and daughter of a king was none the less a quiet narrow-chested girl fifteen years old gentle pious and awkward with neat pure features and smooth braided hair that had no special charm or grace francis with his ideas of splendour and chivalry desired a different queen for his sumptuous court and her he found in margaret a woman then of three-and-twenty both learned and witty and with a charm more attractive than beauty in her slender carriage and tender smile margaret young de moult joyeuse vie et la meilleure compagnie possible margaret was virtually the queen of france hers was a dangerous although an honourable position she was young and under the spell of that sweet pale face that abundant soft blonde hair her brother's courtiers called her the most beautiful of women she was unhappily married and possessed neither love nor esteem for her husband she ruled without scruple the laxest court of europe yet singular among the women of her court the duchess of alencon never had a lover the virtue of the young princess gay as she seemed was quite secure she looked on all her would-be lovers with a sweet remote ironical compassion and turned away to seek her books again she had an almost pedantic love of learning theology grammar classics romances she gave them each a share of the curiosity and interest with which she envisaged life all these tastes and qualities helped to secure her virtue but even greater than they as a safeguard we must place her absolute unrivalled devotion to her brother 
it was the fashion then at court for people of quality to select a motto or device expressing their personality duchess margaret was clever at making these posies she supplied them to her brother to his mistress to half a dozen others for herself she selected a sunflower turning to the sun and underneath she wrote non inferiora secutus the phrase is exact no lower light did she ever follow no wandering glory led her from the worship of that son of hers through all history i think we never come again upon a devotion sustained so long and at so high a pitch as this of margaret d'angouleme for her brother and this idolatry demanded many sacrifices she was to offer it her life and her constant service the interests of her husband the happiness of her child she offered it her judgment almost her conscience and for his sake in her middle age already weary of the world she should forsake the mystical meditation in which she delighted to compose the heptameron to please him in his illness louisa of savoy was scarcely less devoted as great a love and ambition filled her heart but was met and thwarted there by other passions by intenser personal cravings she was not like margaret a sunflower seeing only one object turning only to that she was a passionate personal violent woman eager for love eager for money eager for power yet subordinating these intense desires to her motherly ambition her passion was as strong as margaret's devotion both these women lived only for the glory of francis let us see of what stuff this idol was made there is i believe no good portrait of francis in his youthful manhood the face so familiar to us is of a later date a dreadful face with its sly and carnal look the long coarse nose and full voluptuous mouth it seems as if some pressure of blood on the brain weighed down the eyelids over those small and narrow eyes and inflamed those florid cheeks over which the coarse dark hair falls down a dreadful face truly apoplectic sensual indifferent cunning but from the frequent contemporary representations of the field of the cloth of gold we can believe that in fifteen twenty the king looked different from this still slender tall and elegant in figure he rode his horse gracefully and was first in every pastime his long face with the small eyes is not yet swollen and reddened by indulgence and disease it has indeed a gentle benevolent and royal expression an air of kind knightliness and this is the pose which francis affected he was to be the amadis of kings he was brave to folly ideally rash in love and in war he was fantastically honourable a story in the heptameron relates how having discovered in his court a stranger who had conspired to murder him francis gave a great hunt and led the traitor aside to a lonely glade he offered to cross swords with him in fair fight and then sent him pardoned away such stories as these captivated the popular imagination and the splendid court of francis his love of art his taste in architecture his considerable skill in poetry all this completed the national enchantment for france notwithstanding her love of thrift has ever demanded glory or magnificence from her rulers also the person of the king was widely known his habit of traversing the country through and through hunting pleasuring inspecting frontiers made all men acquainted with their monarch and the nation delighted with his showy chivalry found their prince a picturesque object for devotion but woe to those who expected more solid qualities from francis fickle and variable as he was versatile he veered from point to point with every wind at bottom a profoundly indifferent nature he cared only for the convenience of the moment he accepted devotion gracefully but it did not occur to him to repay it 
his confidence was the one reward he bestowed on those who gave their lives to him and this went far with the women who adored him it gave them an exquisite sense of participation in his interests he kept his grateful sister all her life travelling from province to province en commis voyageur de royauté he left half the cares of his country to his mother but woe to any who in her hour of need expected to receive a like aid or service from the king the queen of navarre never got her kingdom from him madame de chateaubriand in her dreadful prison guarded by her jealous and ferocious husband was left to die without a word a certain louise de crevecoeur discovered too late the heartlessness of her lover do you not know she writes that those in prison make use of poison my children and i eat nothing without i find an antidote for our food it is for my love of you that they hurt me thus and you endure it this is sharper to me than the pain that i suffer how terrible a light this chance-found letter casts on the figure of the gay handsome brave young amadis who was at this time the hero of europe it is for my love of you that they hurt me thus and you endure it from many an honest servant of francis this cry must have gone up for neither gratitude nor pity beat under that dinted breastplate of his yet after all these years knowing the end and despite our great contempt we feel the glamour that surrounds the figure of this ardent young poet and soldier this brilliant hero of the renaissance and how much more did not his radiance blind the women who adored him as their hero and their king scrivere a luisa di savoia e come scrivere a la stessa trinita so wrote the witty blasphemous cardinal bibiena and it was true francis repaid the love and service of his worshippers by his confidence louisa and margaret were scarcely less powerful than himself on all political questions he consulted these contrasted minds the violent autocratic louisa and margaret the modest and humane unconsciously to themselves these different natures paralyzed each other and the policy of francis is a brilliant tissue of inconsistencies uncertainties and sudden disasters francis though so newly king of france did not forget that by inheritance he was also through his descent from valentina visconti hereditary duke of milan the sforzas the successful usurpers claimed possession as nine points of the law and maximilian the emperor demanded milan by right of his overlordship each was equally resolved to possess in that city the key of italy but these words milan italy meant more to francis than a mere political position to his intensely artistic temperament a corner of italy was more precious than the whole of france milan to him meant beauty poetry gardened villas in which to pass a soft abandoned leisure women more fair than those of his kingdom churches and palaces which he the great builder knew how to value lax and subtle lombard art from the first days to the last of his life the thought of milan haunted him like a passion and to the shadow of unpossessed italy he constantly sacrificed his substantial realm of france his first hazard ended in success and made the name of the little town of marignano a word to conjure with in france no sooner was his reign begun than with lautrec and with bayard with the chivalry of france the young king resolved to conquer his longed-for inheritance he sent bayard in advance with la palice no sooner did they set foot in piedmont than they took prisoner prospero colonna the general of the swiss in the pay of maximilian sforza when this news reached francis who was at lyon with his mother his sister and his wife nothing could restrain him from marching into italy he sent his wife who was near her confinement with louisa and margaret 
to the familiar palace of Amboise. He left Louisa, Madame, as she was now styled, Regent of France, bade them farewell, and soon was in the mountains. He arrived in Lombardy in time to follow up the successes of Bayard and La Palice. The Swiss, rumoured invincible, had gathered in large reinforcements to defend Milan. Near Marignano, the French under Francis encountered them. It was, says General Trivolzo, a battle of giants. They fought all night. The proud mother writes in her journal, The 13th of September, which was Thursday, 1515, my son vanquished and defeated the Swiss near Milan. The battle began at five hours after noon. It lasted all the night and the morrow until eleven o'clock in the morning, and this very day I left Amboise to go on foot to Notre Dame de Fontaine to commend to her that which I love more than myself. It is my son, glorious and triumphant Caesar, subjugator of the Helvetians. Sunday, the 14th of October of the year 1515. Maximilian, son of the late Louis Sforza, was besieged in the castle of Milan by the French and made a conditional surrender to my son. The 14th of December, 1515, my son took the oath of peace with the King of England. Thus, a year after his accession, we find Francis a conqueror in Italy, at peace with the great powers, adored and glorified in France. So begins his reign. There were in Europe at this time two other sovereigns, young and rich, though without the brilliant elegance of the French monarch. Europe lay, in fact, at the feet of these three youths, two of them caring for little else but war as a chivalrous game and peace as magnificent leisure, while the third was equally uninspired by public spirit being engrossed already with the dreams of a subtle and tremendous ambition. In 1519, the old emperor Maximilian died, and each of these three kings stood forward to contest the empire. The eldest of them was Henry of England, eighth of the name. He was twenty-eight years of age, handsome, tall, blonde, and ruddy. His features, says Lodovico Fallier, are not merely beautiful, they are angelic. Robust in figure, he did not yet show signs of the extravagant corpulence of his middle age. He was vigorous and active in all sports, vain, jealous, arrogant, but as yet the arrogance seemed only a bluff English sort of dignity. Handsome, rich, and valiant as he was, Henry had not much chance for the empire his kingdom was not a large enough state. No one was on the side of the King of England, says Fleurange. The real rival of Francis was Charles of Austria, King of Spain. These two were rivals not only for the empire, but for Burgundy, for Milan, for Navarre, and for the Netherlands. They were nearly equal in power, for while the domain of Charles was the vaster, that of Francis was more homogeneous and more compact. In temperament, as different as in interests, each was born to be the antagonist of the other. Charles was the youngest of the three. Born in 1500, he was 19 years old at the time of the death of his grandfather. In the previous year, on the decease of his mother's father, Ferdinand, he had succeeded to the crown of Spain, for though his mother was recognized as queen, she was unfit to govern. She was that poor mad queen of Aragon who mourned so tragically the brutal Austrian husband who ill-used her. Charles was brought up far from the fantastic neighborhood of his mother. He and his sister were given into the care of his father's sister, the politic Margaret of Austria, who educated them in the Netherlands, where she ruled as Maximilian's governor. But all her care and healthy influence could not prevent Charles from inheriting the somber temperament of Juana. The man, who when emperor of half the world should turn monk and dwell in the Escorial, 
was as a boy without brilliance without activity without fire a pale taciturn studious lad he seemed no formidable rival en cuidam certain petit roi said the french and laughed in their sleeves they did not notice his hungry eyes his powerful chin they did not see the subtlety and power of combination which this pious quiet lad inherited from ferdinand and isabel the rare outbursts of determined energy which showed him the grandson of the fiery max he was in truth a most formidable adversary so it appeared when in fifteen seventeen the three kings as candidates for the empire sent from france from spain from england their delegates to frankfurt says fleurange as many were for the king of france as for the catholic king but not one for the king of england and the day came at last when the election must be made when it was cried aloud in the great church of frankfurt charles catholic king elected emperor and this being done gave great joy to those who wished well to the catholic king and great mourning to them who were for the king of france and they were vexed and bewildered for they had spent in vain the monies they once had francis had lost the chance on which he had surely reckoned he never forgave his rival on the other hand he looked for help and friendship to henry of england it was natural that the two defeated candidates should band themselves together against the winner francis was sincerely attracted to henry friendship no less than policy counselled him to make this tall vigorous blond young saxon his ally but henry it would appear had never much reliance on his brilliant neighbour he had the inbred natural english mistrust of a french jackanapes and in this special case it did as well as penetration he was jealous of francis's success in sport in love in war and while the french king thought he was winning henry by his grace and vivacity he was really only fostering the blind antagonism of henry only feeding his jealousy and his dislike to feel himself inferior moreover though it was certainly advantageous for france always more or less at war with the empire to make a firm alliance with england england could choose between france and austria and england with her laden ships sailing ever to and from the port of antwerp commercial industrious england might naturally choose the power which ruled the netherlands in the treaty of fifteen fifteen between france and england there stood a clause providing that the two kings should meet each other in personal interview at some place on the confines of their dominions somewhere between french ardres and english calais at last in fifteen twenty this friendly encounter was finally arranged france and england half ruined their resources for each to shine once in the eyes of the other during three weeks the jousting and revelling went on for three weeks francis tried all his graces on his rival hoping to win his trust and gaining instead his deadly jealousy the whole court of either country was present on the field all clinquant all in gold like heathen gods the two sad neglected queens encountered there and there henry met in the french camp margaret's beautiful english maid of honour the black-eyed slim anne boleyn there met two rivals no less potent than their masters wolsey of canterbury with his retinue of colossals and charles de montpensier constable bourbon bearing in his hand the sword of france henry of england looked on the constable noted the tragic face wedged like a knife in the hill between the black masses of his hair and said to francis were he my servant i would cut off his head had francis taken this advice he had not paid too dear for the field of the cloth of gold but no end none did reward that vast expense henry would give no promise of alliance 
and when the splendid camps were struck and the french court were journeying home to paris francis was overtaken by the news that henry had gone to meet the emperor at val without flourish or display the secret charles had gained his ends in a plain soldier's tent he arranged his business with england almost directly after war was declared between france and the empire on the vexed questions of milan and navarre england remained neutral for the nonce but it was reported that henry would bring forward his claim to the crown of france when charles invaded burgundy so in wars and rumours of wars ended the tourneys of the field of gold end of section three section four of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three the affair of mo fifteen twenty to fifteen twenty three part one the useless magnificence of the field of the cloth of gold had exhausted the treasury of france while charles without wasting a sou had obtained a practical interview with henry the emperor was sure of at least the neutrality of england he was rich and ready for war francis on the other hand had to borrow money from the florentines and had secured no aid from england on the contrary the whole of the north of france was seized by an intermittent panic in many a bank of clouds men saw an english fleet coming to lay waste and ravage and this open unprotected impoverished northern country was left without armies almost without garrisons for all the scanty soldiery of france was drawn away to the south to fight in navarre and to defend imperiled milan war surprised francis without men or money the promised florentine loan was never paid nothing remained but to tax the suffering country tax after tax was levied unbeneficed priests were rated as laymen benefices were bought and sold still money enough was not collected then the king took down the great silver grating costing six thousand seven hundred marks which louis the eleventh had placed at the tomb of saint martin once this would have been loudly clamoured against as sacrilege but now men were too miserable to clamour or if they murmured if they said strange things and dreamed strange dreams if starved afraid abandoned they made for their refuge a faith uncredited and unknown their dim voices were not heard in the noisy clangor and splendor of sixteenth-century warfare for in the towns of picardy and normandy the quiet artisans looked and noticed then pondered many things in their hearts the useless glory of the rich the squalor of the poor the corruption simony and vile immorality of the church death near desertion present the world bitter vague unreal over their looms the weavers bent and dreamed the smiths and armourers hammered strange thoughts into their iron the very clergy read new meanings in their missals a great idea had stirred in the silent womb of the quiet industrial abandoned north of france a thought continually born dead born again into the world god is all the rest is nothing says the bourgeois of paris in the year fifteen twenty there arose in the duchy of saxony in germany a heretic doctor of theology named martin luther who said many things against the power of the pope and wrote several books which were printed and published through all the cities of germany and throughout the kingdom of france and in fifteen twenty one there was a great famine so that in paris no corn and no bread were to be found in all the town for any price and throughout the land of normandy a still greater famine and scarcity of corn and of bread 
so that ten bushels of wheat sold for ten livres and it must be noted that the greater part of the town of meaux was infected by the doctrines of luther meaux was a town of weavers a great industrial centre close enough to paris to share the intellectual activity the fervour of speculation which signalised paris from the time of duns scotus to the time of vatable meaux was yet aloof apart removed from the envies and glories of the court from the hurry and business of the capital it was a town of priests and weavers from the episcopal palace there a mild elderly bishop swayed the quiet city this man guillaume brissonnet a gentle humane dreamy scholar ex-man of the world garrulous and mystical had gathered about him the most thoughtful of the french clergy under him meaux remained a serene oasis among the spreading cupidity and corruption of the church the pious the wise the speculative spirits of france were attracted to that placid neighbourhood the great lefebvre d'etaples gerard roussel michel d'arande settled there then all at once this humane and idealistic clergy this starved fiery mystical population of weavers and artisans was seized with a sudden panic charles was besieging mezieres hunger desertion fearful ravage hovered over all alike the world was proved an impracticable an intolerable place of trial there was nothing to comfort men saving to build a refuge unseen and secure a land that no rude soldiery could trample under foot a haven where all were welcome the same spirit breathed upon clergy and populace with interests already divorced from the material world celibate and scholarly underfed and sedentary visionaries they threw themselves heart and soul upon the hope of god in a few months the mysticism of meaux was an organic and progressive movement from the bishop to the lowest journeyman weaver in every class men spoke the same strange dreamy words foretold the same necessary purification turned with the same energy to the newly discovered scriptures quoted alike the wonderful commentaries of lefebvre des fifteen twelve to fifteen twenty two which began the great reformation in europe guillaume brissonnet bishop of meaux a vague and holy nature was not without the vanity of the mystic a man of sincere sympathy sincere emotions his lack of precision in feeling and thinking condemned him to play an insincere part he did not inquire of himself whether he really felt to the same extent of daring and suffering the intense faith that stirred the awakened clergy the miserable populace of meaux he sympathized with them he was their bishop it seemed right to him to stand in the front of their movement to be their man of god so we find grouped below this gentle mediocre bishop with his incomprehensible flow of mystical garrulity men of ardent and incisive faith like lefebvre d'etaples and gerard roussel guillaume farel michel d'arande all the heroes of the french reformation for a long time brissonnet de meaux who called these great men to shelter in his diocese appeared a holier and wiser man than they it was to this man of god that the duchess margaret wrote when war and disaster suddenly confronted her with the problems of existence she knew him it would seem only by repute but in sore distress of soul she sought his aid as suffering women of old sought the help of a greater reformer margaret's soul had been born in the trouble and sorrow with which she learned that her brother's kingdom was menaced her brother's life in danger his safety and honour trusted o oh, haunting unspeakable terror to the shallow mediocrity of her own husband 
for Charles of Alençon was to lead the vanguard of the war. The brilliant, accomplished, joyous young princess was suddenly made into something more than this. I must now meddle with many things which may well make me afraid, so she writes to Brissonnet, craving from the unknown the sympathy, the aid she could not find in the familiar. How should they guide her now, these Bourbon and Bonnevet, wholly given to the world, these poets and scholars, Marot and Budet, intent on prosody and grammar? No, her long studies in theology, her conversations with Madame de Chatillon had taught her to look for other consolations, and she was sorely in need of help and friendship. This war, which heaped upon her so many fearful doubts and troubles, took from her at the same moment all her support. The brother she adored, the husband she had grown to regard with friendly acquiescence, and taking her kinsman and acquaintance, took also the sweet companion of her early womanhood, the tender and spiritual Philiberta of Savoy, her mother's young half-sister. So, looking on the future with miserable eyes, aghast, sick at heart, Margaret wrote to the far-famed man of Meaux, and begged him to send her for comfort his chaplain, the learned Michel d'Arande. June 1521. Monsieur de Meaux, knowing there is but one thing needful, I have recourse to you to beseech you in God's name to deign by prayer to make yourself the means that he may please to lead M. d'Alencon according to his holy will. For by the king's command M. d'Alencon departs as lieutenant general of the army, which I misdoubt me will not return without war. And since peace and victory are in his hand, and thinking that you wish well not only to the public good of the kingdom, but also to my husband and to me, I employ you in my affairs and demand of you spiritual service, for I must needs meddle with many things which well may make me afraid. And again, to-morrow my aunt of Nemours leaves us for Savoy. Wherefore I recommend her and myself to you, and pray you, if you think this a fit season, to let Master Michel depart on a journey hither. It would be a consolation which I only desire for the glory of God, leaving it to your discretion and to his. La toute votre, Marguerite. Thus, in this naive, earnest appeal for aid, begins the strange correspondence of Brissonnet and Marguerite, a correspondence eight hundred pages long, fantastic, mystical, bewildering, beyond belief. It is difficult to comprehend the consolation which Margaret found in this interchange of metaphors. I share my cake with you, she cries, telling the good bishop of her trouble, and Brissonnet forthwith responds, Ah, madame, understand that there is in this world a cake of tribulations for you to share with your useless son, made from scattered tares, ground in the mill of sorrow, kneaded with cold water in the trough of infidel and disobedient presumption, baked in the furnace of self-love, of which the eating has been a fig poisoning the architects and their posterity until the unleavened meal has been put in the cask of human nature. And again, in answer to some appeal of hers, he declares his own unworthiness in still more mystical and astounding fashion. Who is deserted is abysmed in the desert, seeking the desert and not finding it, and finding it is yet the more bewildered, and a poor guide is he to guide another out of the desert, and to lead another into the desert desired. The desert starves him with mortiferous hunger, although he be full to the eyes, goading his desire but to satisfy it and impoverish it with poverty. Margaret at length is herself in fault. This last message is too hard for her. She beseeches Brissonnet to speak more plainly in a letter which pathetically endeavors to copy his own extraordinary style. De-metaphorize yourself, she entreats him. The poor wanderer cannot understand the good which is in the desert for lack of knowing that she is deserted. 
prithee for kindness sake run not so swiftly through the desert that she cannot follow you in order that the abyss invoked by the abyss may overwhelm in its abysm the poor wanderer margaret but brissonnet cannot refrain from pursuing so fructiferous a metaphor as that which the last sentence of the duchess offers he replies at once without demetaphorizing the abyss which prevents all abysses which in saving from the abyss whelms in the abyss without overwhelming or spoiling on the deabismon l'abisme on l'abism sans l'abisme which abyss is the bottomless bottom of things the way of the wanderers without road or path etc in this galimaufry of absurdities it is difficult to catch the allusion to the mystical love of god which absorbs all thought feeling envy and leaves the soul absolutely devoid of personal existence the body quite without desire or sensation this longed-for death in life is the bottomless bottom of things and we comprehend that a thought so unthinkable could not well be conveyed in precise and reasoned language we remember that such mystical speculation couched in clear and logical terms as in the writings of master eckhart becomes merely negation or at most agnosticism and we are inclined to set aside brissonnet as a worthy dreamer not quite sure of what he dreams but on a more careful reading we begin to wonder if this involved and intricate style be not merely a means to set the suspicious off the scent of heresy and treason blow with your breath often upon the fire divine writes margaret to him set alight the wood that is still green and he replies the true fire which since long has been lodged in your heart in that of the king and madame by grace the greatest and most abundant that i can conceive i know not if this fire has been covered and slackened i will not say put out for god in his goodness has not yet abandoned you but ask you each in your heart if you have let the fire burn up according to the given grace i fear you have procrastinated i fear you have deferred but i will pray him to light such a fire in your hearts to wound them and pierce with such unbearable love that from you three may issue a flame burning and setting alight the remainder of your realm End of section four. Section 5 of Margaret of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3. The Affair of Meaux, 1520 to 1523, Part 2. So we perceive behind this mask of metaphors a great and tangible effort, the endeavor to convert the royal family of France to the new ideas, to the wish for reform. Margaret, herself an eager proselyte, throws herself ardently into the scheme. Her frequent letters to Brissonnet are chiefly concerned with this supreme topic. During the siege of Mézières, she brings her mother to Meaux, where they spent the winter, and on their departure Margaret does not relax her efforts madame has begun to read in the holy scriptures you know the confidence that she and the king place in you and lefebvre writes to rejoice with her in the progress of the good work the king and madame writes margaret are quite decided to let it be made known that the truth of god is no heresy indeed at that time when protestantism as a church in revolt did not as yet exist when lutheranism was the most cultured fashion of the age it appeared faintly possible that francis the father of letters might be brought to favour the opinions professed by the most learned the most intellectually brilliant scholars of europe but margaret in this matter did not understand the temper of francis and of her mother lax and frivolous in regard to the spiritual importance of catholicism they believed it none the less a necessity of good conduct 
that vast hierarchy appeared to them as a temporal force in which all government and authority were rooted. Louisa and Francis were not of the pious. I have canonized Francis de Paul, at least I paid the tax, cries Louisa, and she makes sport of a fricassee of abbeys which was served up on the death of a certain prelate. Neither she nor her son were in awe of the church, of their faith, of their deity even. But they had an immense reverence for the temporal authority of Rome. Any other religion would prejudice my estate, says Francis, and in this opinion, adds Brantome, King Soliman perfectly agreed. This quoting of the Grand Turk, the Antichrist himself, as to the importance of the Catholic Church, proves exactly how much and for what reasons the court of France respected it. Heresy, as to opinion, was perfectly in accord with the king's liberal taste, but heresy as an agent, as a factor, must be put down with fire and sword. Gradually, Brissonnet apprehended this fact, and being an excessively timid and hesitating nature, he bitterly regretted having gone too far. In sore distress of mind, he wrote to Margaret, this Brissonnet who had so sternly admonished her for procrastination, let it please you to slacken the fire for some time. The wood you wish to burn is so green that it will put out the fire, and we counsel you for several reasons, of which I hope to tell you the rest some day, to leave it alone, if you do not wish to quite extinguish both the brand as well as the surplus which desires to burn and to inflame others. But Margaret was too deeply in earnest to hesitate. She never had learned to be afraid. Her sanguine temperament had no doubt of success, and she seemed in a fair way to succeed. Madame had read St. Paul from curiosity and for amusement. Her daughter already made sure of her conversion. My sister-in-law, my dear sister, is quite of our opinion, she writes to Brissonnet. This may have been Madame de Vendôme, the other grandmother of Henry the Fourth but I am inclined to believe that Margaret found her first convert in the good, stolid, gentle Queen Claude. Such success was followed up, for Margaret did not heed her correspondent's timid expostulations. The misery of the time, the ever-increasing disasters, inclined all minds to religious enthusiasm. Milan was lost as easily as gained, Navarre, conquered in a fortnight, was taken from the king as quickly, Charles was laying siege to Mezieres, Henry was expected at Calais, enemies were all around, and hunger in the midst. Among such conditions the movement spread and grew. In her intrepid faith Margaret conceived the reformation of the entire duchies of Alençon and Berry. But she found difficulties in her path. The secrecy that must needs be kept, the lack of adequate helpers, the denseness of the people all retarded the work which he considered la salut des âmes, the salvation of souls. She writes to Brissonnet in September 1522, complaining that Michel d'Arande had had to leave too soon. Have pity on the country where he had promised to stay for some time, and which is so deprived of men of his kind that to subsidize my duty left undone neither through absence nor negligence, I had prayed him to succor the poor sheep there. The surety of the porter and some little cowardice of soul prevent me from writing more. A worse trouble soon came in the declared enmity of the Archbishop of Bourges. Margaret possessed absolute temporal control in the Duchy of Berry, given her by Francis in 1517, she administered justice there even as in Alençon, but she was powerless against the church, and now the Archbishop of Bourges threatened Michel d'Arande with imprisonment for life, interdicted him the pulpit, and fulminated excommunication against his hearers. For the church at first amused, careless, curious, became alarmed and angry at the extent of this heresy. The Diet of Worms, 1521, signalized the importance of Luther, 
and the orthodox french party the clericals the sorbonne or faculty of theology became aware that they too had a nest of lutherans in their midst there was talk of burning and of branding a formal censure of the new ideas was pronounced by the sorbonne one should employ rather flames than arguments against the arrogance of luther ran the text and before the church of notre dame de paris the writings of luther were burned to ashes as a warning to his followers the propositions of luther were condemned one by one and none more heartily than that which maintained that the burning of heretics was contrary to the teaching of the gospel le fevre des tables was threatened with the stake then a descent was made upon the town of meaux well known as the headquarters of the new ideas farel mazurier lefebvre and many others were obliged to flee for their lives others were made prisoners in the dungeons of the sorbonne and now a terrible choice was left for the gentle cultured timid brissonnet his turn would assuredly come next he trembled this prophet who had in him something of the mystic's insincerity and all the sensitive versatility of the dilettante in face of exile captivity torture the stake his presence of mind utterly failed him and the man of god was found after all a weak temporizing amiable ecclesiastic for the sake of a theory he could not betray his order sacrifice his liberty his life so on the fifteenth of october fifteen twenty three he issued a decree against those who abusing the gospels deny purgatory and the saints on the thirteenth of december he preached against the lutheran pest he joined himself with the sorbonne against his former flock launching out decrees of exile and condemnation like any magister of paris no doubt he argued to himself that where he counselled flight another would have lit the stake but his apostasy caused him much hatred as may be imagined this bishop brissonnet says antoine fromont fearing to lose his bishopric in his life turned his coat and became a persecutor of those whom formerly he had instructed soon after this miserable bishop haunted by remorse resigned his see and died of despair a marvellous example of the horrible judgment of god against those who persecute the truth having known it this bitter tone this acrimonious arrangement of simple facts for brissonnet died quietly enough and maintained to the last his character of the enlightened man of culture is common to all the lutheran historians of the time by the catholics also he was regarded with suspicion and dislike already some months before louisa of savoy wrote in her diary by the grace of the holy ghost my son and i began to recognize the hypocrites white black gray smoke-colored and of every hue from which god in his infinite clemency has seen fit to preserve us these hypocrites we can have no doubt were her pious neighbors of meaux brissonnet her correspondent lefebvre who sent her the epistles of st paul master michel her chaplain all lutherans at heart louisa never pardoned this attempt upon her faith and brissonnet disdained by the reformers whom he had betrayed was no less himself an innovator a suspect a hypocrite in the eyes of the catholic party so strangely fallen was the man of god my son and i writes louisa she makes no note of margaret whose mystical fervour was heightened by persecution she was now more than ever identified with the party of reform for their abrupt danger had touched the strongest fibre of her nature her compassion for the oppressed heedless of her own peril she toiled day and night to rescue and preserve these impoverished fugitives to obtain a hiding-place for this a pardon for that a pension for the other and she worked to such purpose she used to such effect her influence with francis that from fifteen twenty one when the persecution began 
until 1525, the year of the captivity, no victim was burned alive at the stakes of the Orthodox. Still, there were other miseries, flogging, branding, torture, miserable dungeons, from which she could not rescue all suspected. And the spectacle of so much pain and such injustice wounded her gentle heart and did not rankle there. Strange tenderness for the oppressed that showed no reverse of hatred for the oppressor, constancy in well-doing that knew no disdain for the weaker and more fickle, this exquisite humanity, this perfume of charity, is the very breath of Margaret's soul. While rescuing Roussel and Lefebvre, sheltering the poor shepherdless flock of Meaux, she felt no bitterness toward their betrayer. She did not resent the failure of this timid pastor to whom she had entrusted her soul, and so many others. He, having flagged and fallen away, she quietly stepped into his vacant place and took upon her slender shoulders the burden he had dropped. From this moment, Margaret, not Brissonnet, is the centre of the movement of Meaux. No censure escaped her lips. She did not even interrupt her correspondence with the bishop and maintained it always on the same tone of reverence and appeal. Perhaps it was not all charity. At least, I think, a factor in that long-suffering charity of hers was a certain chivalrous denseness, a certain obstinacy in clinging to an ideal which made her patiently accept the faulty Brissonnet as her spiritual superior, even as she accepted Francis as her perfect hero, despite the many foibles, the long debasement, the patent degradation which would have disenchanted any other worshipper. The pedestal on which this idealizing woman set her idols was so high that she did not see their feet of clay, and bowed down before her shrines, she offered a lifelong, unparalleled devotion to those whose real qualities she never even saw. End of section 5section six of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four constable bourbon fifteen twenty one to fifteen twenty four il me faut mêler de beaucoup de choses qui me doivent bien donner crainte thus margaret wrote to brissonnet in 1521 already indeed she must have felt the dreadful approach of nearer troubles than wars with the emperor or uneasy peace with england in that year the king took from his schoolfellow constable bourbon the right to lead the vanguard and gave it to his brother-in-law d'alencon a man without genius or experience of warfare in the next summer, Louisa of Savoy began a lawsuit against this Constable Bourbon, her cousin, in which she laid claim to the Bourbon estates. Charles de Montpensier, a Bourbon cadet, had married Suzanne, the hunchback daughter of Pierre, Duke of Bourbon, and Anne of Beaujeu. Naturally, he took possession of the vast inheritance which came with his wife from her father and her mother. But the crown declared that the estates of Anne of Beaujeu lapsed at her death to the king, and that she had, in fact, a mere life interest in them. And Louisa, a niece of Pierre, claimed his inheritance on the death of Suzanne. Thus, in her cruel anger, she hoped to denude the constable of the whole of the inheritance of his dead wife. Such a hatred as hers, altering the whole course of Europe for many years, deserves to be explained. Louisa was a violent hater, nor was this the first shock that her private spite had given to the public wheel of France. She had already hated the House of Foix, Madame de Chateaubriand, the king's almost royal mistress, and her brothers Lautrec and Lescan, the viceroys at Milan, in order to secure the disgrace of Lautrec, 
Louisa had intercepted the money which the king had finally dispatched to pay the Swiss troops in the Milanese. Louisa embezzled the money, and the mercenaries revolted. Lautrec was disgraced, and France lost Milan. And now Madame directed her hate against a greater rival with larger interests at stake. The constable Bourbon was, after the king, the most important personage of France. He possessed, through his marriage with Suzanne of bourbon beaujeu no less than seven French provinces. When his eldest child was born, the king stood sponsor, and the guests were served at table by five hundred gentlemen in velvet. No prince in Europe displayed a more stately magnificence than he. He was indeed a striking and picturesque figure, this half-Italian soldier, only five years older than the king, but looking more resolved, maturer, with his tragic southern aspect, set mouth, and great melancholy eyes. He was no less brave than Francis, and a far better leader, for indeed good soldiership was his natural inheritance from his Bourbon ancestors, who had all been generals, and his Gonzaga forebears, all condottieri. He was the cousin of those Mantuan Gonzagas who had but lately added Montferrat to their domains. This French Gonzaga was no less resolved to rise. Through a prudent marriage he had become the richest man in France, and he was determined that his courage and address should make him the most powerful. Already in 1513 Louis the Twelfth had created him Constable of France, as a reward for his prowess in battle. King Francis, on his succession, might, however, have annulled this dangerous favor. No wise sovereign would permit a prince, young, popular, of a great race, and immensely rich, to remain constable of France. An office so powerful, if occupied at all, should only be filled as a compliment to bygone valor by some decrepit general too old to mutiny, for the constable was virtually king of the army. The sovereign himself in time of war could order nothing save through him. Knowing this and seeing the constable's proud and resolute mien, Henry of England had said in 1520, were he my subject, he should no longer wear his head. But Bourbon meant to wear his head, and if possible a crown upon it. He found a means to keep in favor with the king through the all-powerful influence of Louisa. Louisa was forty-five years old, but still very handsome. She was far more ardent and vehement than in her youth, violent and tender at once, credulous as to the effect of her charms, in fact a woman made to be deceived. She fell passionately in love with this dark young Bourbon, whom she had brought up with her own children, and for some time he made great use of her affection. She was the king's mother and a very clever woman, still handsome, still courted, no doubt, in spite of the thirteen years' difference between them. He would have married her if no heir had been born to Francis, and during the first three years of his reign, Queen Claude gave the king only daughters. But in 1518 the Dauphin was born, in 1519 Henry, the king's second son, and then Bourbon began to shift his plans. If he still courted Louisa, it was in the hope of winning René, Queen Claude's young sister whom he wished to marry, and as a means to the favor of the Duchess Margaret, with whom he fell in love, and gradually Madame perceived that she had lost him. She remembered all that she had done for him, how her influence had kept him in power, all the pensions she had heaped upon him, 24,000 livres as constable, 14,000 as gentleman of the chamber, 24,000 as governor of Languedoc, this in addition to his vast estates. She remembered that she was old, and he was young, that she loved him, and he used her to his profit, and then in her furious indignation she strove to undo all that she had done, 
to shatter this grandeur she had herself built up so in fifteen twenty one the king took the leading of the vanguard from bourbon who was at least a soldier and gave it to alencon and in fifteen twenty two madame began her lawsuit for the bourbon estates bourbon was quite aware that the king's mother rightly or wrongly was certain to gain her suit he was also aware that shorn of his lands his power would be gone he was the greatest landowner in france the extent of his estates had become a proverb l'empereur est grand terrain plus grand que monsieur de bourbon writes clément marot he was in fact the standard of comparison he was resolved not to lose his importance but only two courses now were open to him either relying on louise's past affection to marry her the rival heir or in case of a decision granted in her favour to mutiny against the crown of france charles of bourbon indignant high-spirited outraged decided on the latter course he was already regarded as the head of the popular party the graver of the nobles were with him louis de Brézé, seneschal of normandy saint vallier and many others all the great personages says charles v are for him the parliament no less saw in the constable the advocate of its rights and privileges persistently disregarded by the king the lawyers were with him and the liberal bourgeois he was supposed to be the great reformer the man who had the wrongs of the country at heart this virtuous prince writes cardinal wolsey seeing the ill conduct of the king and the vast extent of abuses wished to reform the kingdom and assuage the poor people this of course is stating the case from the point of view of the enemies of france yet if bourbon had remained in his own provinces there is no saying how his rebellion might have ended england and the empire saw with delight this dissension between francis and the greatest of his subjects they each sent a secret envoy to the constable and it was privately agreed that as soon as francis should be gone to reconquer milan the english should invade picardy the germans and spaniards enter guienne and burgundy while the constable should seize the central provinces the kingdom conquered each should satisfy what he considered his just claims henry should take the north and call himself in earnest king of france charles regain his old dukedom of burgundy the constable should govern provence and bourbonnais as a sovereign prince so three claimants should be satisfied and france exist no more to such a pass the enmity of louisa and his own furious anger had driven the constable he had of late had much to suffer the king had publicly insulted him at table his generalship was taken from him his estates were to be handed to another but at present bourbon endured in silence waiting for an expedient to leave paris almost in battle array let us hear how it struck a contemporary the bourgeois of paris writes and my said lord of bourbon on friday the twenty seventh of march of the said year fifteen twenty two left paris by the king's leave to go through brie and toward provence and he took with him all the archers and all the crossbowmen of paris in order to take five or six hundred evil livers and bandits which did much harm in the flat country there and many of them were hung and thence he went into his own land of bourbonnais in the said year fifteen twenty three friday the eleventh of september news was brought to paris by rene the lyon messenger that m de bourbon had left the land of france and on our lady's day in september had departed in secret from this land of bourbonnais and by the sound of trumpet he was proclaimed a traitor throughout the land of france and it was proclaimed that whoso should take the said lord of bourbon and deliver him into the hands of the said grand master my lord alencon or into the hands of m de la palice the king would grant him ten thousand golden crowns 
or for information where he could be taken twenty thousand ordinary crowns but soon it became known that no one would easily earn those ten thousand golden crowns for m de bourbon was in the camp of the emperor preparing to invade provence the tide of opinion suddenly turned bourbon was no longer a popular hero men saw in him and justly a traitor leagued against his country with her bitterest enemies nothing could have been better for francis whose carelessness and frivolity had begun to disgust the more serious of his subjects he was again the knight of france the champion of the french the ogier of his time the true amadis defending his kingdom from a traitor while bourbon mistrusted even by his allies obtained but the third place in the emperor's army the marseillais fought so well against the constable that a panic seized the invading army thrust back pell-mell into italy defeated without a blow meanwhile the nobles of bourbon's party refused to rise the rebellion came to nothing End of section six. Section seven of Margaret of Angouleme, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter five. Sequels, fifteen twenty four to fifteen twenty five. Hélas, la palisse est mort, il est mort devant Pavie. Hélas, s'il n'était pas mort, il serait encore en vie. Quand le roi partit de France, à la malheur il partit. Il en partit le dimanche, et le lundi il fut pris. Chanson de Pavie francis was not satisfied that he had preserved his kingdom and secured his crown a second time he determined to reconquer milan against louise's earnest prayers he crossed the alps again to fight for that milanese which her bitterness had lost him and across the alps with him went many a gallant gentleman who never should return bayard and bonnivet and la palice should fall upon the field Alençon returned to die of a broken spirit. Montmorency and young Navarre, with the king himself, should fall into a long captivity. But these were all impatient then to fight the emperor, because the traitor Bourbon was sheltered in his army. The presence of Bourbon in the imperial camp was indeed the strongest motive that Francis had to continue the campaign for the situation was in the highest degree difficult and desperate. Germany, Spain, and England were banded together against France, which, after a definite success against the emperor's army under Bourbon and Pescara, might with all honor have proposed an advantageous peace, but Francis could not rest until the traitor was punished, till the traitor was punished and beautiful Milan reconquered so in an evil moment he led his army south louisa who strongly disapproved of this rash venture margaret anxious and grave with her husband and her brother both in italy remained at lyon with the poor consumptive queen claude was dying in great resignation at twenty-five years of age before the armies reached milan the king received the news that she was dead he who had neglected her living felt a genuine pang at her death i had not thought he cried in naive remorse that the bonds of marriage were so hard and difficult to break could i buy her life with mine she should live again but claude was beyond all care and kindness she left her little boys francois henri and charles and her three little daughters the pious loving charlotte beautiful magdalene and wise little marguerite in the custody of their father's sister henceforth margaret was to them as a mother and the most touching and charming of her letters were those written to the absent king about his motherless children 
Margaret had many troubles with this family of nephews and nieces, and in her busy home at Lyon, eagerly she watched the distant campaign where her husband was, and her brother, and Montmorency, her lifelong friend. Yet the gout of Madame and the measles of the children seemed the most eventful things. Madame had injured her health with nursing the Queen. I fear her health grows weaker and weaker, writes Margaret, and indeed reflecting on the dangers and disasters which her passions had brought upon the kingdom, Louisa may well have grieved and grown weak. The extremity of sorrow which she shows for the death of the Queen is quite incredible. Yet Louisa had never been a tender mother to poor ailing Claude. But Margaret, with her sweet, dense kindness, was not the woman to discover if anything worse than mourning ailed her mother. Like all idealists, she was not very quick of insight. To her, the death of Claude was an excuse sufficient for all, and without inquiring too deeply, she strove to heal her mother's wound by a tender care which sheltered her as far as possible from trouble and apprehension. Just then the children took the measles. Margaret would not tell her mother so ill and weary already, nor her brother, who needed all his heart for battle. It is only to Bishop Brissonnet, no less than heretofore a guide, philosopher, and friend, that she opens her troubled heart. It has pleased our Lord to give Madame Charlotte so grievous a malady of fever and flux after her measles, that I know not if now he will take her to himself. This is on the 15th of September, but poor little Charlotte was not so easily released. For thirty days she was very ill. Margaret scarcely left her side. She dearly loved this tender spiritual little soul to whom in after days she dedicated a poem which we shall hear more than once again, Le Mirouré de l'âme pécheresse. While she stooped over the bed tending the sick child in anxious loneliness of fear, the great affairs of the world went on outside. Milan was recaptured, siege was laid to Pavia. But these battles and sieges seemed all dim and lifeless, like a figured tapestry shaken in the wind, while alive, suffering, and real, little Madame Charlotte lay upon her knees, and Margaret spoke with her of Jesus and of Paradise. At last an end came. The poor little girl succumbed to exhaustion, delivered from a little body that could not live on earth till eight years old. And Margaret writes to Brissonnet in a strain of strange religious exaltation, like to that she displayed again in later years upon the death of her only son. Where the strongest has come, he hath vanquished the armed flame, and hath commanded the sea to stop its waves, and hath left content and joyous, nor able to praise him enough, my heart and my spirit. Even to say the truth, he hath cured and fortified my body, vainly laboring with little repose for the space of a month, while the little lady was ill. But after her death I suffered for the king, from whom I had concealed his daughter's illness, who yet divined her death, having dreamed three times that she said to him, Farewell, my king, I go to paradise. Adieu, mon roi, je vais en paradis. And this caused him an extreme sorrow, which, by the goodness of God, he endured patiently. And Madame, who had not heard of it, learned it all through a captain of adventure, and bore it in such a manner that from dinner-time till supper, one tear not waiting for the other, without uttering sighs of impatience or vexation, she did not cease to preach and undertake toward me the office of comforter which I owed to her. Soon Margaret had to comfort her mother for a far heavier sorrow. The easy success of Milan was not followed up before Pavia. Yet the 3rd of February, 1525, Francis dispatched to his mother a letter three quarto pages long, with a plan of Pavia enclosed, showing her how certain the French army was of taking the town by assault. Ten days later the battle took place. The French army was routed with disaster, 
all the great soldiers of France killed or captive, the king himself a prisoner. So ran the dreadful news. Worse still for the weeping mother and daughter at Lyon, it was soon known that the cowardice and incapacity of the Duke of Alençon was the cause of the worst disaster. He, the leader of the vanguard, had failed to come to the rescue of the king, abandoned by his Swiss. Not even Bourbon, the triumphant traitor, was more execrable that day in France than he. On the evening after the battle, Francis, in his captive's tent, drew off his ring and sent it to Soliman. By a less secret messenger he sent a letter to his mother. Of all things I have none left but honor and life, which is safe. Yet he beseeches them not to give way to too extreme sorrow, for still I hope that in the end God will not forsake me. And so, like true comforters, Margaret and her mother hide their desperate grief from him, writing cheerfully about little things, beseeching him not to fast, it is bad for the health, thanking God that his honor and life are safe, and hiding from him the dreadful task they have, poor women, to keep order in the panic-stricken realm when the full extent of defeat is known. Bayard was killed in the autumn, and now Bonnevet is slain. Les de Foy, La Palice, the great marshal, they are all dead, with many others who were as a tower of strength. And Montmorency, the wise and cold, he and the young king of Navarre and Brion, the brilliant Admiral Chabot, are prisoners with the king of France. But Alençon, the disgraced, the hated, the shameful, he is neither dead nor in prison. Sick at heart, leading the miserable remainder of his troops, he makes his way to Lyon, where his wife awaits him. As he marched along, he must have heard the bitter words and angry songs of the resentful populace. The length and breadth of the land are sore against les fouillards de Pavie. I hate more than poison, cries Rabelais, a man who flies when sword-play comes into fashion. Why am I not king of France for eighty or a hundred years? My God, I would crop the tails of the curs who fled from Pavia. And in every village the laborers sang the first chanson de Pavie with its melancholy close. Mais par Jean des Honnêtes, vous laissez lâchement. Another ballad was sung to the air. Que dites-vous ensemble? Through the streets and along the lanes where the voices of the plowers echoed gravely, the miserable duke must have heard the same monotonous chant, Qui vit jamais au monde, un roi si courageux, de se mettre en bataille et de lasser de ceux, en qui toute fiance et qui tenait à sœur l'ont laissé en souffrance, Vela le meilleur. By the time the troops reached Lyon, the unhappy man was ill with despair and remorse. It was now April, two months after the disaster, but France had not yet begun to forgive him. Even his wife, the gentle Margaret, would not see him. The man she had never really loved was odious to her since he had ruined the brother she adored but when she learned how seriously the poor defeated general took his failure to heart, how he was actually dying of his disgrace and her resentment, then pity and duty came to her aid. She wrote to Francis. As for your poor sister, she writes this letter to you sitting at the foot of Monsieur d'Alençon's bed. He has prayed me to present you, with my own, his very humble recommendation, and to say that had he seen you ere he died, he would go more happily toward paradise. I do not know what to say to you, my lord. All is in the hand of God. Only I beseech you not to sorrow, either for him or for me, and be sure that whatever comes, I hope that God will give me strength to keep my trouble from Madame. On the 11th of April, the mediocre, luckless, unhappy Alençon breathed his last. Margaret, drawn close to him by these last days of shame and pity and sorrow, 
sorrowed for the death she scarcely could regret she writes those first two days made me forget all reason but since then my lord my mother has never seen me with a tear in the eye or a mournful face for i should hold myself too much more than miserable if i who can do you service in nothing were the cause of hindrance to her courage who does so much for you and for all yours but whatever i can do to give her recreation believe my lord i do it for i desire so much to see you both happy together that hoping in god to have this blessing i neither will nor can think of any other thing End of section seven.